Welcome to the last video in Module 4. In this section, we're going to be talking about how astronomers calculate and measure star masses and one method for calculating star distances. These are properties of stars that we have not yet discussed and are really important for understanding how stars go through their life cycles, which is our big focus in Module 5. We will also be learning about other methods for measuring distances in Module 6 when we talk about much bigger distances than just to the closest stars. So let's get started. In Module 3, especially when we were thinking about Chapter 5 from OpenStax Astronomy, three of the big things that we learned how to do was to figure out a star's surface temperature, by figuring out the location of the peak energy output in the black body curve, applying Wien's law, either as an equation or as an idea. Uh, we learned how to determine a star's chemical composition, so what elements are present, and eventually we started to talk about the fact that astronomers can even, even figure out how much of each element are present, and by looking at those absorption lines, they can even categorize stars into different spectral types. And then finally, one of the big things at the end of uh, Chapter 5 in Module 3 was to talk about the fact that we could determine a star's radial velocity, how quickly it's moving towards us or away from us, using the Doppler shift. So these are big ideas, but they have not helped us identify a star's mass. We have learned the equation for gravity so that we have an understanding that this force of gravity, and we've even talked about orbits, that's probably going to be playing a role in figuring out mass. Um, and we have talked about the difference between how bright something appears to be and luminosity. We've even discussed the inverse square law where distance is relevant, but we've not talked about how astronomers measure distances. Those are the two goals of this video. So we cannot measure a single star's mass just by receiving light from it and looking at that spectrum. We cannot do that. However, what we can do is study enough systems that have multiple stars in orbit, figure out those dynamics, and then see if a different quantity that comes from the light can give us mass. So that category of stars that we study in order to calculate masses directly are binary stars. So binary star systems are two stars in orbit around a single center of mass point. I want you to think a little bit about um, the last time that you've either been on a seesaw or have seen a seesaw. So if we imagine two kids of equal weight um, on the two ends of a seesaw, they'll be able to balance. That wouldn't be very exciting, they're probably going to go like this, but they could just get it balanced um, nice and flat. If an adult and a kid were trying to do that as well, in order to actually balance and not just have the adult sitting on the ground with the kid in the air, the adult would have to actually sit much closer to the center of the seesaw in order for that balance to work. So whether you've tried that or not, um, that is something that I hope makes some sense as I describe it, because what we're starting to be able to think about then is if those are stars and the point of the seesaw balance is the center of mass point, we can see how each of those two stars is um, located relative to that center of mass point based on what their orbit looks like, how they are orbiting, how quickly it takes to orbit, and apply all of the different tools from Module 3 um, for that system. So astronomy, astronomers study binary stars in three different ways, and if you'd like to pause the video to write all of this down, I think that's a great idea. We're going to be able to show examples and describe each of these three types of binary systems in the upcoming slides, but I want to give you the summary ahead of time so you know what it is we're trying to apply. So pause if you want to write anything down. We are going to see each of these show up in the upcoming slides. So the key thing is that the binary stars are simply orbiting each other. The fact that we're categorizing them into different types of systems is related to how we are observing them, not because they are inherently different. They're still two stars orbiting each other. The limitations here um, are worth recognizing. We're going to start to understand um, that these limitations are of different um, consideration, and although all of these methods have limits, the most common method is going to be the spectroscopic method. 
So let's look at each of these in detail. So the first type of thing that we um, can study is a visual binary system. So let's focus just on this left image. If we were to look at this binary system over the course of four years, using different telescopes to take data to see where those stars are relative to each other, we are taking images to compare them, we can see a couple of things. So first of all, it's worth considering based on our understanding of telescopes from Module 3, as you look over the April 2000, February 2002, that set of dates, those were using different telescopes. I want you to think briefly to yourself. I'll give you the answer, but pause if you want to after I give you the thought. Out of all of those observations, which one or two were using telescopes with the worst resolving power and which one or two were using telescopes with the best resolving power. So if we think back to um, that understanding, we can flip back to our notes if we need to. Resolving power is telling us about how small of details we can actually pinpoint. And effectively, it's telling us about pixel size. That April 2000 and January 2004 sets of images have these giant pixels where the star is only resolved to maybe two to four pixels in total. Those are very low resolving power. They have a bad resolution limit because they can't see small things. Whereas maybe March 2003 and December 2003, we're using telescopes with the best resolving power it's a little hard to tell that they're pixelated at all, especially the December 2003, where we can clearly see the brighter star and the dimmer star as circular points of light um, rather than a couple of, of pixelated blobs. Now, when we look, we can see that there is a brighter star and a dimmer star, and they are physically moving around the sky. There is a term for this idea of moving across the sky, and that's proper motion. That's where this other image on the right comes in. Proper motion describes any star motion that's across the face of the sky. And for binary stars, it's noticeable um, on the order of months and years. For other stars, we typically don't notice that proper motion unless we're waiting really, really long periods of time. So this is showing that based on the motion of stars that we can calculate, the Big Dipper will look obviously different if we wait tens of thousands of years compared to what it used to look like, what we see it as now, and what it looks like in the future. So visual binaries, we're studying images, we're tracking that proper motion. For spectroscopic binaries, often we can't even see the two separate points of light. The system is too far away, um, and so images won't help us at all. So instead, we can see if the orbit has any amount of tilt that gives some towards and away um, component, we can measure the Doppler effect in the two sets of spectral lines. So let's say that maybe um, these are the two sets of spectral lines. As they move across, sometimes they line up. Sometimes um, the one set is blue shifted while the other set is red shifted and vice versa. And when we see that shifting back and forth in Doppler effect, it is because those stars are physically moving towards us and away from us over time. So this data set is showing two stars in a spectroscopic binary where on the left set of um, diagrams that show the system, we might be um, viewing it from the bottom of the page, off way far away on Earth. And on the right side, we are showing the curves that have already taken the Doppler effect, how much, how much shift there is, and turned it into a speed. So what we can see is that it gets faster and slower and faster and slower, and the positive speeds meet away from us, negative speeds mean toward us, and so we can get that whole sense of motion. What we also see is the whole system has a kind of baseline positive radial velocity. So the whole system is moving away from us, away from us, um, but it is also doing that orbiting. So it's interesting um, to recognize that astronomers can pick apart those two different motions, even though they both are using the Doppler effect. And if we look by tracking when the... Um, map of the radial velocity to time, when the graph 
repeats itself, so we get back to from the very beginning to point four again, we can see that this system takes a little over 17 days to orbit each other. It's a kind of close system. Uh, and that one of the stars moves much faster compared to the other, which means it is farther away from that center of mass. Uh, and with that, we can pick apart and determine the two masses of the orbits. We're not gonna get into that level of calculation detail for this introductory non-science majors class, but this is the starting point that astronomers would have, and it connects to the learning that we've already been doing. And then the last type of system is an eclipsing binary system. So two stars that um, orbit each other so that one goes directly in front of the other. And when that happens, there's going to be two different types of um, dips in the total brightness measured um, over each instant in time. One of the stars passes in front of the second star, and then the second star passes in front of the first star. So we can tell apart the two stars based on the shape of that dip, and we can figure out the, um, the period of the orbit from how long it takes for that whole process to reset itself. And so again, that becomes enough information for astronomers to then do the calculations necessary to get mass. Calculations that we won't use in our curriculum, but that we want to recognize what it is, what tools they are using in order to get those masses. So once we have measured a bunch of these binary systems, then we can plot them all um, on a chart and see if there's a clear trend. And very helpfully for us, for, um, for stars with masses and measured luminosities, remember that's the true brightness, so we actually need to know their distances. We'll be talking about that in a second. There is a very clear trend in the data. We could make a line that goes through all but um, just a few of these points, and those outliers have something else going on in their system, or they have extra research being done about them. But in general, these, these points all fit along the line here. And this is the mass-luminosity relation. It is really key to figuring out how um, to estimate a mass for a star all by itself. So let's say, for example, that we were able to get enough measurements to see a star that's all by itself has a luminosity of 100 solar masses. We could use this relationship by saying, okay, the 100, we go out to where it hits all of the points, or we plug that number into an equation, and then we drop down to see what mass it would have, or we would calculate that mass from an equation. And we would see that a 100 solar mass, uh, a 100 solar luminosity star would have a mass of about three times the mass of the sun. And all of a sudden we have that number as a really solid estimate, even though we don't have any orbital dynamics for it. So very, very powerful, and it's one of the reasons why binary stars are so useful to astronomers. It's a big deal for us, a big part of our curriculum. So make sure that if there's anything in the types of binaries that you don't understand or why this relation is so useful, to follow up with me or review the book um, so that we feel confident in it. That relation allows us to take a calculated luminosity and estimate a mass. So the last topic we're going to cover in Module 4 so that we don't leave it behind when we're discussing all of these different properties of stars, is parallax. And it's how we measure the distances to stars. We will learn about a lot of different methods for calculating distances in Module 6, but stellar parallax is the only method that does a direct measurement. Everything else has to be calibrated off of stars that have parallax measurements. Now, this system uses um, some fairly straightforward uh, geometry, thinking about triangles and angles, and uh, I'm going to describe how surveyors use it on Earth, and then we're going to compare it to what is happening uh, on, um, on our skies. So if a surveyor has two different observation stations, they can use their instrument to kind of point at the same object and then swing over to figure out the angle from that tree to the other observation station. So they're able to measure an angle 
and walk from one observation station to the other, so we get a baseline distance that is known, and with that, and some straightforward geometry, we can calculate that dashed line distance between the baseline and the tree. This works by um, seeing the tree at a different location relative to the background from one observation station to the other. We can do the same kind of thing. We can see how much shifting has happened when we um, look at some object in the room, maybe um, past the computer where you're watching this, and close one eye and cover up that object with your thumb. Now, if you switch which eye is closed, your thumb will appear to move against that background. We're gonna repeat that on the next slide once we introduce the astronomy part of this parallax idea. But in the end, it comes down to this perspective shift. So stars nearby have big parallax angles, which means when looking at them from one side of our orbit to looking at them on the other side of our orbit, they appear to shift the way that our thumb did against the background um, in the room, or the way that the tree would appear to move against the background mountains and rivers from one observation station to the other. Now the key thing here is the baseline from point A to point B is a known quantity. That would be twice our distance to the sun, so two astronomical units. And we are measuring that shift against the background, so that's an angle on the sky. So just like with the surveyors on Earth, if we measure the angle and we know the baseline, then we can get that dashed line distance from the baseline to that distant object. The equation ends up looking quite simple, P equals 1 over D, because astronomers have taken out all of the complicated um, constants that might show up in it by defining a brand new unit for the distances used here, a distance measured in parsecs. Instead of meters, instead of miles, instead of light years, we have a new distance unit because of this um, measurement, this calculation called parsecs. That term comes from parallax and arc seconds, so they squash it together, parsecs. The parallax angle is measured in arc seconds, that's a small fraction of a degree, and the distance is measured in parsecs, where one parsec is about three and a little bit uh, light years. So the distance to the nearest star is about four light years, or 1.3 parsecs. Now, uh, one thing that is really worth understanding is that if we're ever not sure on how the shifting compares to the distances, we can always pull out our eyes and thumb again. I want you to try that experiment one more time. First, have your thumb really close. So this would be the star that we care about. And remember, you're picking something in the room that you're covering up, and then you're seeing how much shift happens when you switch which eye is open. And then do the same thing with your arm fully extended, and what you'll see is the shift is a much smaller shift when your arm is fully extended. For very distant objects, this angle becomes harder and harder to measure. So at some point, stars that are too far away, we cannot measure this and get a distance. So this is a system used for the nearby stars, stars on our side of the galaxy, and we will learn about other distance measurements in Module 6. But for now, that wraps up Module uh, 4 for us. Uh, when we come back in Module 5, we'll be talking about the lives and deaths of stars uh, and how they evolve over time. So I look forward to that. It's some of my favorite topics, and I will see you then.